Hey y'all, it's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. And today we are getting into the subject of Mardi Gras and specifically Mardi Gras of 2021. I'm in a really important spot for Mardi Gras right now. This is St. Charles Avenue, the street that the streetcar goes down that connects the French Quarter to the Garden District. Lovely, sedate street most of the year. And this is where normally during Mardi Gras season our parades roll. And you can tell any time of the year because there are beads in the trees. Our float parades go down one side of the street. Beads get thrown to the crowds below and a lot of them get stuck in these branches and they last all year though gradually with the elements a few of them are going to tumble down and for somebody who knows new orleans really well you usually can look at a photo of saint charles avenue and kind of guess the time of year by how heavy the bead growth is this is going to be the first year in a long time that we don't get a bead harvest from these trees we haven't lacked parades on saint charles since 1979 we haven't had parades canceled throughout the region since 1945. So this is a big loss for us. And of course, it's part of a year full of losses. So when the news came that we weren't going to be able to have Mardi Gras parades this year, sensibly that we're not going to be able to have Mardi Gras parades this year, you know, we grieved that as we have grieved a lot of other things this year that we've lost other festivals like Jazz Fest. We've lost jobs. We've lost friends. And then once we grieved it, we said, screw it, we're gonna figure out how to do it anyway. This isn't a thing that we skip. So what we're gonna do today is take you through the ways that 2021 Mardi Gras is happening and the ways that it's gonna be different. We're gonna give you just as essential historical foundations to make all of this stuff make sense. And we'll do that at a Mardi Gras museum down in the French Quarter. After that, we're gonna hit up the place where the floats are made, get you an inside view of the process and some of the floats themselves. We're gonna talk about Mardi Gras throws, some of the places where they come from, how that they're made, as well as we're gonna see places honoring and supplying the costuming traditions in New Orleans. And finally, we'll get to how houses are being used in place of floats this year to deliver the vibe that we know and expect out of this season. So we're gonna start in the French Quarter. I'll see you down there. So y'all, for a little taste of the history, we're in Jackson Square. I think we come here in probably half of our videos, but there's a lot of good stuff here. And in this case, we have the Presbytere next to us, which is the home of the Louisiana State Museum's Mardi Gras collection, as well as their Katrina collection. So if you ever wanted to learn the history of New Orleans Mardi Gras and Louisiana Mardi Gras, which are a few different things depending on where in the state and where in the city you go, this place is kind of the primary resource for that big picture. In the even bigger picture, the holiday's older than we are. So there has been a Mardi Gras going back into medieval Europe, and it even maybe has some influence from ancient Roman festivals. So it's part of the Catholic religious calendar at its root, and that's gonna give us a religious flavor to it, definitely, but it's celebrated in really secular ways through a lot of parts of the world. People in Louisiana have been cognizant of that date, even though it moves around, going back as far as we know anything about. One of the very first French place names in Louisiana was Pointe du Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras Point, and it was named that in 1699, a good couple of decades before New Orleans was founded. So French colonists coming here, far, far away from where that holiday was celebrated, were still cognizant of where on the calendar it fell and still eager to pay tribute to it somehow. The way we do that in New Orleans today has changed a lot. So Creoles, the folks who lived in the French Quarter, would have celebrated Mardi Gras with balls and with street masking. And those are still critical pieces of it today. The thing a lot of people from out of town think of, the float parades, which we love too, those are gonna come in in 1857 with a group called the Mystic Crew of Comus. And they start some patterns that we've definitely built on and have changed over time. But like, you see some fundamentals that have lasted since that day. Mardi Gras parades being produced by these social clubs called crews, that's still a part of the puzzle. We definitely still have some of the accoutrements of those early parades. It was one of the first few that established the idea that the Mardi Gras colors are purple, green, and gold, which you will still see if you visit in or around Mardi Gras season on all kinds of buildings. And a lot of that's in the French Quarter, a lot of it's on homes. This is kind of a normal year. We're gonna see the 2021 version of this, 
as we go into some other parts of town, which is gonna get way above and beyond the norm. So that's coming up later. For the moment, we wanna get a little bit into where the parades come from and what they look like now. That's gonna bring us to a place called Kern Studios, which you might know as Mardi Gras World. That's up next. Y'all, we stepped a little bit outside the French Quarter to a place called Blaine Kern Studios, better known to a lot of visitors as Mardi Gras World. So this is one of the places that makes and displays floats. From the outside, it's pretty innocuous, apart from the branding. From the street, though, as you passed by, you'd see a giant sea god and an alligator letting you know a little bit of the magic that's made inside. These guys are one of a few companies that do this. They're the largest one. You'll find some other smaller ones, like Royal Artists that produce just a few parades. And some of the parade crews are also going to design and build their own floats. But because they're the largest one, pretty much if you ever visit during a carnival season, you will see some Blaine Kern floats. Even if you come outside that season, there's a very good chance that a parade is going to be happening. And even if not, you can visit this spot. It's the only one of the companies that has a space open to the public all throughout the year where you can see the floats up close and personal. Sometimes in a lot more detail than you'd be able to see them if you were watching the parade. And you can also watch the process of making them. These guys have actually been a big part of changing that process over time. When these guys first got into the business in 1947, when Blaine Kern Sr. founded this company, typical floats were drawn by mules, they were built mostly out of wood, and they were decorated with painted paper mache. So they display a few of those older pieces from as early as the 1970s built in that style. You're gonna see mostly foam fabrication going on now. So they will sculpt the basic figures out of giant blocks and sheets of styrofoam. Some of that work is done by hand and some of it is done by a huge robot named Pixie. And then once they've made the basic shape, they're gonna cover it with a paper mache layer that allows for painting. And they're gonna finish it with another material that'll make it more long lasting. So. In that process, these guys are building hundreds of floats per year. They do it at bulk, and they do it for a lot of different crews, which have different design needs all around. The parades are all pretty different from one another, but crews have a few things in common. They, for one thing, have that word in common, which goes back to the mystic crew of Comus, the very first float parade that we had. And crew, since those days, is spelled K-R-E-W-E, -E, which is a fake old English spelling of just the word crew, C-R-E-W. And crews are social organizations that are gonna do various things throughout the year, but primarily usually revolve around making a parade happen. They also are gonna share in common, usually being named after some kind of idea from world religions or civilizations. And so you have the crew of Rex, the crew of Comus, sometimes drawing from Roman mythology. You're gonna have the crew of Cleopatra and the crew of Isis coming from Egypt. You're gonna have the crew of Zulu making African references. You have a lot of different Greek gods. And these guys were actually part of founding one particular crew. So a little more than 50 years ago in 1968, Blaine Kern Sr. was brought on board to design the very first run of the crew of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine and theater and partying. And Bacchus was designed around the whole idea that Mardi Gras needed to be bigger. We had a number of tourism magnates basically in town who thought that they weren't getting enough visitors to town for Mardi Gras. And so they wanted to make something flashier and more impressive that they thought y'all would like more. So they decided scale was the thing to increase and Kern Studios provided that from day one. They started building bigger floats and they started building them with moving parts and their own lights. And nowadays, Bacchus is one of several of what we call super crews, which are the ones with the highest production values and they also throw by far the most stuff. So every year they're debuting new floats, but if you visit here, you can see some of their classic floats. There's a few that they use every year with occasional replacements and renovations. For example, if you came here now, you would see King Kong and Queen Kong, which are actually floats without riders. Typically, you're gonna have a few dozen riders on a float who are the ones throwing things, but parades like Bacchus throw so much stuff that sometimes they will have a special float just for throwing things back. So you may have noticed on Queen Kong, there are beads stuck all over her. And after you've had so many things thrown at you in the course of watching a parade, it's nice to do some of the throwing at the end. This year, these floats are gonna be staying put in this and the other warehouses around the city because parades are the thing that we cannot do. So there's various ways that we're coming at that. One thing we're doing is we're having an event called Floats in the Oaks. Our city park, which normally hosts the Christmas lights viewing in December, is gonna have floats spaced throughout it from lots of different crews. 
where you can drive through and you can see them one by one rather than in a huge crowd. And they're actually gonna have bands and dancers spaced in between, making it very much like a typical parade experience. We also had way back at the beginning of the season, a parade that did something pretty similar. For the past few years, we've had a parade that happened on the first day of the season, January 6th, called the Crew of Joan of Arc which didn't actually have floats. They would be mostly on foot and on horseback doing medieval European cosplay. And these folks decided as the season came in to do a drive-through experience for, of what they called Tableau. And Tableau is an idea that goes way back to the beginnings of Mardi Gras. The crew of Comus way back when and the other really early Mardi Gras crews, when they did their parade, they were gonna finish the route at a theater. And then a select invited group of the attendees was gonna go inside and watch the members of the crew arrange these tableau. So you'd be on a stage and it would create these pictures that evoked a famous moment in history or a famous painting. So tableau really are one of these ancient styles of celebrating Mardi Gras, which we don't see a whole lot anymore. So in that way, by doing tableau, the crew of Joan of Arc was bringing it way back to the beginning and reviving an old Mardi Gras tradition. What this version, the driving through version, doesn't allow for is throws, which are a really big part of what we tend to do and what we think makes our Mardi Gras different. So I wanna show you a little bit of how those work and get into how some of the parades are dealing with the absence of throws this year in some pretty creative ways. Next up, we're gonna to go to a spot that sells those throws. It's gonna be a little ways from here. Y'all, we're at one of the places that sells Mardi Gras throws. You can find them for sale in the French Quarter, absolutely. And there is a convenience markup, let's call it. And if you're walking beneath the balconies on Bourbon Street, you can also find them for free there in exchange for what let's call barter. So it's possible to get them there, but most of us who live here know that there's the option to get them at places like this at a significantly cheaper price by Coming out to the suburbs, we are not in the parts of New Orleans that most visitors are ever gonna come to. And as you can see, it is a place to visit pretty much exclusively by car. And you would be surrounded by strip malls and chain restaurants and uh, other things you would not find in the French Quarter, let's call it. But here and there, there's these little locally owned businesses. But these things are a lot cheaper here. So if you wanna shop like a New Orleanian for Mardi Gras or for Christmas, or for Halloween, or for a Saints game. Here's one place you could come. Y'all, any given year, the number of beads flying around is enough that by the time students at Tulane University, where we are right now, walk back to campus the short distance from the parade route, they are so weighed down with what they've received that they will throw their stuff up into formerly a tree, now a specially built structure just for the purpose. So each year there are so many beads flying around that they almost become more of a burden than a prize within a few minutes to a few hours after the parade. So with that in mind, the volume of beads that we have, it adds up to a lot of expense and that expense is borne by members of the crew. While visitors to town will pay for beads sometimes, normally the people buying them are the ones who are riding on the float. So not only is a crew member required to pay yearly membership dues, which for a parade like Bacchus is gonna be in the neighborhood of $1,000 a year, you might spend just as much on the things you're gonna be throwing. And it won't just be beads. It's gonna be beads, stuffed animals, plastic cups, little plastic coins called doubloons with an image of the parade's logo and its theme for the year, all of which become these collector's items over time. Beads are the bulk element. The other things become special. It wasn't always this way. It used to be that beads, as they were thrown in Mardi Gras parades at least, were made of glass and you'd have a relatively small number of them to hand out in the course of a parade, so that if you got a string of them, it was a pretty big deal. They were cheap, but not nearly as cheap as they are now. And as we got into the Super Crew era, we end up seeing mass production in China in plastic, and that allows the huge numbers that are thrown around today to be out there. And that's one of the things we don't have this year, is beads flying through the air in those huge quantities, which might not be the worst thing that's changed about Mardi Gras this year. 
Normally, at the end of a parade, we have an amazing cleanup enterprise that happens. It's actually one of the most remarkable parts of the parade to watch is all the people who come and empty the garbage out of the streets afterwards. But there's a lot of garbage produced and you end up having about 2 million pounds of waste produced by every single Mardi Gras season. You can't do a whole lot with beads. Basically, you can use them to decorate your fence or your house. You can put them in a bag in your attic and save them for friends who visit town, or you can use them again. You can give them a second life flying through the air at a future parade, at least as long as they physically last. So there's a form of recycling that's possible, and once in a while we throw them into potholes to fill them in, but they're not even all too good for that. So as we get into modern Mardi Gras, and especially with hiccups like this year, we kind of ask ourselves what we should be doing with this tradition. And for one thing, we have a scientist from LSU who in the last couple of years has announced the ability to make biodegradable beads out of algae. That's a process that is gradually becoming more affordable and may at some point take over for the mass produced plastic stuff we see. Locally produced ones made out of paper is a thing too. And also just less throws sometimes is a strategy people take. Also for that feeling of specialness that beads used to deliver, more and more crews have shifted over to having a specialty throw where even if the parade itself is produced by Blaine Kern or otherwise has a big factory made kind of aesthetic, they make something specially that's distributed to a few select members of the crowd who have an amazing costume or who knows somebody or who put on the right display of energy during the parade. These are gonna vary a lot. The crew of Muses is one of the most famous for having its bedazzled high heels covered in glitter and rhinestones. And the crew of Zulu has the honor of having a special place in Louisiana law. Most places in throughout the world that have Mardi Gras parades don't throw a lot of things. That's our special thing. And because enough people have been injured by throws, there is Louisiana law saying that parade organizations are not responsible for injuries incurred during a Mardi Gras parade by flying objects. And specifically in that law is the word coconuts. The Zulu parade has been throwing coconuts, gradually more and more painted and decorated over the years. And those are maybe among the more dangerous flying objects. Technically, they're supposed to hand them to you or gently toss them to you. And now with this year and throws being completely out of the question, we're starting to see people adapting in some really interesting ways. Muses is only producing a few of its signature shoes this year, which they're gonna be distributing through a few different endeavors. Some of that is gonna be straight to healthcare workers. Some of that's gonna be through a shoe fairy who is going around town, finding people who look like they deserve it and passing off one of the year's shoes to them. And they're also doing a stiletto lottery, a stilato, through which they've partnered with a bunch of different businesses around town where you can visit once per day and use a QR code to enter yourself in this lottery. And the idea is each of those things at the end of the season is gonna draw for one winner for the shoe that their business gets. And it's meant to get people out to these businesses that maybe they've fallen out of the habit of visiting. So it's a whole lot of different retail and food establishments along Magazine Street, St. Charles Avenue, and in our business district. So if you're here in town as a visitor or as a local, that's one way to both give some support to local businesses and to possibly get one of the rarest kinds of music shoes there's gonna be. Bacchus, the crew that we've discussed for having some of the most throws, has opted to have a digital parade this year. So they've created an app and they're having numerous small parades throughout the season and then a big one on their final day where they will be throwing lots of digital things, a few of which can be redeemed for real prizes, but the rest of which you get the satisfaction of catching and then they take up very little space in your attic or in a landfill or really even on your hard drive by the time you have them. Oh my God, this is, this is actually very much like being at a Mardi Gras parade. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think I just caught a tape measure. Making signature throws is crafting, and people who are a part of the parades that do these have special places they go to get the supplies they need and to do the work sometimes. So next thing we're gonna show you is some of the places where the supplies for costuming and for throw making come from. Y'all, if you like what you're seeing so far, hitting the like button doesn't just tell the world how you feel, it also helps other people find this video. And if you hit subscribe, you'll be the first to know when we drop something new. We cover lots of cities in the US and Europe, so there's plenty more to see besides New Orleans. And now back to the tour. Yeah, we just way across town to NOLA Craft Culture. This is in Mid-City. This is a real New Orleans building. And this is one of the places where not only things like Muse's shoes 
would be crafted and where the supplies to make them come from, but also where you would get stuff to make costumes. And a lot of that is the same materials. This place stocks a lot of different things, but specifically glitter galore and every type of glitter under the sun, every color in edible, wearable and biodegradable versions. So lots and lots of stuff to find here that you would not get at your typical craft store. And they also have a crafting space. Anyone who's worked with glitter before knows once you have glitter in a room, it never goes away. So you can do the glitter crafting here and not have to leave a trail with you where you're going home to. So they also run classes and stuff. So bachelorette parties here, anything like bachelor parties for that matter, great place to work on something together during a group trip. And there's a lot of people who make their costumes here. Actually, DIY costuming is a deeper part of New Orleans history than float parades are. We've been doing that, as far as we know, back pretty close to the city's origins, if not all the way. And it's one of the traditions that pervades really almost any of the places where Mardi Gras is observed that I know of. You got a lot of different masking traditions, and really all they have in common is that all of them are on foot. We've talked about the big crews like Bacchus, which are expensive to be a part of in the first place and also just aren't everybody's vibe. And so you get various groups that get created around the idea of doing something on foot. One of those with a name very similar to the crew of Bacchus is the crew of Barkus, where people dress up their dogs around some kind of common theme and take them on a long walk through the French Quarter each year. So that one is having a digital parade this year, worth looking that up. And really just in general, any year, any time of year, crew of Barkus is one of the best image search terms that's out there. Then we also have a crew that is very close to my heart. I did my first Mardi Gras parade last year with the crew of Chewbacca. This is a merger between Chewbacca, the Star Wars character, and Bacchus, the god of wine. So the mascot of this parade is the sacred drunken Wookiee. And what you get basically is a bunch of sci-fi fantasy nerds who are fans of a huge number of different franchises marching with some kind of homemade costume I'm part of a group called Queer Eye for the Sci-Fi, and my partner and I ended up being Sparkle Alien versus Sparkle Predator last year. And we spent a lot of time working here to make those costumes. So that crafting space, very close to my heart. We also have dance groups in the float parades. So there are groups like the Organ Grinders who are going to do rehearsals all throughout the year for dance routines. And then during Mardi Gras season, over the course of a few weeks, they'll go out in the street and you'll have five or six parades that each of them is in doing flash mob style dance routines in full costume. Among all of these masking traditions, y'all, maybe the one that everybody looks up to the most is what are called Mardi Gras Indians or Black Masking Indians. This is one of quite a few Black masking traditions in New Orleans that grew up separately in, during Mardi Gras in the 18th and 19th centuries. We're gonna visit Armstrong Park to get a view of that one. Y'all, we've moved to Armstrong Park, right outside of the French Quarter. We're in the Treme neighborhood, and we're gonna see inside the park, one of the many monuments here, which is dedicated to what are called Mardi Gras Indians or black masking Indians. This is one of the older and longer lasting masking traditions. And in general, black folks in New Orleans have a lot of separate Mardi Gras traditions with their own long lineage, going back to the fact that early Mardi Gras parades were segregated in a lot of ways. So the mystic crew of Comus only allowed a pretty small select number of wealthy white Christian men. And meanwhile, Mardi Gras was being observed and celebrated by everybody. It ends up getting infused with a lot of elements of black culture here, which have some of their deepest roots inside this park via Congo Square. So this was a place where in the 18th and 19th centuries, enslaved people would gather and have some room to play their own music and otherwise express their own culture that turns into a lot of modern traditions like second lining. So we have this street parading tradition revolving around early jazz bands, which is still a huge part of all different kinds of occasions, Mardi Gras and otherwise in New Orleans. In terms of those early parades, the place that there was for a black participant was as what's called a flambeau. So if this was a float parade, flambeau would be people who walked along the side of them. The float was meant to be a work of visual art, and oftentimes these parades rolled at night, so visibility was an issue. Flambeau would carry these huge heavy torches that would illuminate the float. They were lending light to the work of somebody else. 
Eventually, because of learning tricks with the thing and just the athleticism of it, they became a focal point in and of themselves. And nowadays, if you go to a Mardi Gras parade, flambeau walk on their own. They're just a feature of the parade. And actually, if you're around New Orleanians watching the parade, you're likely to see people tipping flambeaus as they go by. But alongside that, you get the development of a lot of other traditions. There's baby dolls, which are women who dress up in these blonde curled wigs and kind of elaborate costumes. You get the crew of Zulu, which nowadays is a float parade that's on the same route as a lot of the others, similar route, but that started small and unofficial and which Louis Armstrong, the namesake of the park, was the king of in 1949. And there's also skull and bone gangs who, on Mardi Gras morning here in the Treme, dress as skeletons and go through the neighborhood super early before the sun comes up. And they make a lot of noise, help everybody start their day on an energized note. And one of the things that they sing as they go by is, you better get your life together next time you see us is too late to try. So they are messengers of death alongside a lot of the fun and delight of Mardi Gras Day. And then there's Mardi Gras Indians, which also are called Black Masking Indians. And the name Mardi Gras Indian refers to the main occasion when they mask, but also to this reference to Native Americans. So there's a lot of connection between Black and Native American history in Louisiana. And that happens because A, both groups are enslaved, B, Enslaved people, African descended, who escaped from slavery in the city, a lot of times found their way to Native American communities outside the city. And C, Native Americans who urbanized often ended up, because of segregation laws and just patterns, ended up in black neighborhoods. And so you have this commonality of ancestry, you have this merging of cultures that happens, and a lot of Folks who mainly identify black in New Orleans these days also know or suspect that there is some Native American lineage in their family. This is the celebration of that lineage every year. It doesn't look like any Native American you'd ever see. No traditional costumes from Louisiana. It is its own whimsical interpretation of the idea and homage to the idea. But it is an incredible piece of craftsmanship. And the guy you're seeing here is a, his name is Big Chief Tootie Montana, is one of the foremost artists of the medium. So you can see with his suit, it's extremely detailed, it's extremely heavy. So all of the detail on this is made from hand-sewn beadwork and built into panels and then sewn together and decorated with feathers, which is what you're seeing all around the outsides, and also in super bright colors. And these suits can weigh a couple hundred pounds easily. So there's an athleticism to performing in them, there's an extreme craftsmanship to creating them. And there's a community element because they form into tribes, these groups that perform together on Mardi Gras Day. And they have a lot of traditions that mirror the practices in Congo Square. They have a tambourine that they call a drum. They still practice on Sundays, the day that Congo Square gatherings happen. All these echoes of some of the earliest known African extracted cultural practices here. So on Mardi Gras, you see in the various neighborhoods these folks celebrate and them coming out of their homes wearing the suit that they have made for the year, processing through the neighborhood. They have their own music that they perform. And if they meet another tribe, there's a mock battle, kind of a dance off that happens. So they are one of the highlights of Mardi Gras Day for people who live here and know the tradition really well. They also have to make a new suit every single year. This is tradition for them that you wear the suit for Mardi Gras and then a couple of other days throughout the spring. But after that, you retire it and it becomes a museum piece, particularly so in the case of this guy. So Big Chief Tootie is known for a few things. One, he's known for the way he died. So he was a long participant in this tradition and he really raised the design standard from suits that were much more modest, some bright rags and feathers to being this incredible work of craftsmanship over the 50 years that he made suits and the 49 different suits that he made. And he actually passed away during a city council meeting. He was at the city council meeting speaking in defense of his tradition after there had been an episode of police violence, police holding Mardi Gras Indians at gunpoint in the neighborhood where they were parading to make them stop doing so because at a, at a very technical level, you know, the parades are, are unlicensed. So after this threat of violence, he shows up to speak to the city council. He's in his 80s, he's retired from the tradition. And it, while he's speaking, he has a heart attack, 
dies in front of them, and this makes enormous news here. There's a whole lot more to that story, but basically because of the life he lived, and his death as well, and the craftsmanship that happened along the way, he really is revered among Mardi Gras Indians as the foremost of that tradition. So his suits are on display, and if you want to see these things and, and the works of other people like him, you can visit various museums. There's the Backstreet Cultural Museum here in the Treme. There's the House of Dance and Feathers down in the Lower Ninth Ward. They've had a hard year. We're actually not going to see a whole lot of this in the street this year. The heads and creators of both of those museums, Ronald Lewis down at the House of Dance and Feathers and Sylvester Francis at the Backstreet Museum have both passed away in 2020. And so with this awareness of lost friends and of, in many cases, lost jobs that make it unaffordable to create a suit like this, even if someone wanted, and just an intense awareness of the risk involved in going out and parading in public, a lot of black masking Indians have decided to forgo this year or the ones that are doing it. A lot of them are going to do it on a much smaller scale, just step out of their suit around their own house and keep it to their nearest and dearest and the people right there in their own neighborhood. So knowing that that stark year was coming, a lot of Mardi Gras Indians gathered out here on January 6th when the season was beginning and also a day that's dedicated to the memory of Big Chief Tootie here. So they gathered around to pay homage, played a lot of their own music. And one of the people present there, unlike a lot of others who were skipping this year, decided to step back into the tradition this year. One of the people that Big Chief Tootie trained was his son, Daryl. Daryl Montana became the chief of the same tribe that this guy was a part of. And he created suits like his dad for a number of decades. And then he retired from it in 2017. He had made, at that point, 47 suits, and he'd agreed with his dad never to pass up his dad's record. But this year, 2021, he is stepping out of retirement to build one last suit, number 48, to get right up under his dad's record and maybe outdo his own last piece of work. Another group that's been particularly hard hit during this year has been restaurants. We've lost a lot of the city's favorite restaurants. Some of those are high-end tourist destinations like K. Paul's, Paul Prudhomme's restaurant in the French Quarter and then neighborhood joints like Little Dizzy's here in the Treme. Many of those have shut down and the ones that haven't are still really struggling to hang on. So fortunately, there is a culinary element to Mardi Gras and that's gonna be our next stop. We're gonna get to one of the places where you can find the signature seasonal pastry, which is called King Cake. And we're gonna get into what restaurants are doing with that this year. Y'all, we are at King Cake Hub in Mid-City right now. This is one of the places to pick up king cakes from lots and lots of different bakers. So king cake is the traditional carnival pastry. It usually starts selling right at the beginning of the season all the way through Mardi Gras day. And this is something that also predates New Orleans' Mardi Gras practices. The French version called a galette de roi is a puff pastry dish with almond paste inside of it. Our version, the traditional one in New Orleans, is more like a cinnamon roll, often with some purple, green, and gold elements. And then you get bakeries making it now that take it in all different directions. I got an apple goat cheese one from a place called Cake Cafe. And this was a, a bakery and restaurant that actually closed this year, but the chef stepped back out to partner with Noka, our arts high school in town, which has a culinary program to produce this for the season. So, some of the restaurants that are still open right now have actually stepped into king cake baking this year for the first time. Brennan's, one of the really famous restaurants in the French Quarter, is making three different king cakes this year. GW Fenn's, classy seafood outfit in the quarter, doing the same thing. And Galatois, one of the oldest restaurants in the quarter, has also gone in that direction. These are high-end places, so it's helping them stay afloat. It's not so much a thing that smaller restaurants are doing, but it's keeping their employees working. And in that way, it means that a culinary career is a little bit more viable in New Orleans during Mardi Gras than it was the season before. The classic bakeries that make these, y'all, really span the spectrum. There's Gambino's, there's Haydel's, there's Dong Fung, and those have Italian, German, and Vietnamese names, respectively. So. All different cultural backgrounds in New Orleans have ended up adopting the king cake as their own. It is a carnival tradition that relates to the King's Day element of the beginning of the season. So King's Day in the Catholic calendar is the day when the three kings were supposed to have found the baby Jesus. And if you buy one of these, typically you're gonna get in the package the pastry and also a plastic baby. In the French version, it's small figurines of different kinds, but the baby is standard here. 
and it represents the baby Jesus. It used to be, when I was growing up, that the baby, by the time you bought this, would already be embedded inside. But just like with throws, that led to lawsuits. And in this case, the bakeries decided this was not a hill that they wanted to die on. So nowadays, you typically find the baby a little off to the side. You get to embed it yourself. And if somebody chokes on a baby at your house, then you can be the one that they sue. It also is a thing that you can get almost no matter where you are. So for us who are in town or if you're visiting town, you can pay this place a visit in person. There is a bit of a line on the weekends, but it's quicker on the weekdays. Lots and lots of other bakeries are carrying them. Some restaurants are actually becoming carriers of king cakes who normally wouldn't do that so they can make a little bit of money off of resale. And these guys are also doing DoorDash this year so you can get things delivered from here. They don't ship outside of town, but some places do, and we're gonna have a list of some of those options in the description. So feel free to go down there and find the choice if you wanna get a king cake and have a small Mardi Gras gathering yourself, where you come from, or a big Mardi Gras gathering. Get as many as you want. Speaking of things that happen at home, we've saved my favorite part of this for last. I wanna show you some of what people are doing with their homes this year as a replacement for what we would normally see in parades. That's gonna be our last stop. Yo, we're back on St. Charles Avenue, and while this street is not gonna have the parades and the bead throwing that it's used to, it is still gonna get its Mardi Gras ambiance and in ways that it never has before. There's some real different stuff going on this year, and it starts from a real quiet moment. One New Orleanian, a few months ago, decided to found a new crew called the Crew of House Floats. And she did that in the most innocuous possible way by just starting a Facebook group under the name. This idea caught fire really fast. And at this point, a couple weeks out from Mardi Gras, there are already a huge number of houses decorated in the way that floats normally would be. And it looks like by the time we actually get to Mardi Gras, there might be more of them than there are of actual floats in a typical Mardi Gras year. Y'all, I think this idea is amazing. And there's a few different reasons why. One of them is that it's just the right thing for us to do, not just this year, but in general. When people know Mardi Gras and New Orleans tradition around it, they know this is something that we should be doing. And Kern Studios made this one. And when Kern Studios is following in your footsteps, you know you have innovated Mardi Gras right. So this is a moment in Mardi Gras history, no question. And any future year you come, I think you'll see some of these. It's also just that it gives individual people a chance to be a part of this tradition in a way, one more way than we've had before. There's been a move for some years now towards the DIY and the homemade, Super crews are great, but everybody wants to be a part of this holiday in their own way. And so in addition to the huge projects like this made by professional float designers, we also have a lot of people who are just doing it themselves. Decorating a house for Mardi Gras has been a thing for a long time, putting up some purple, green, and gold swag and flying the flag of your favorite crew and bedecking your fence with some beads. But this year we are seeing, even just walking around in my neighborhood, some people are doing them in the style of their favorite crew or the crew that they're themselves a part of. Some people are taking a stab at the kind of satire and commentary on current events and sometimes just wackiness. That is a big part of the Mardi Gras flavor. And some people are sourcing it to the professionals. We have the Kern Studios example here, but this is kind of, I think, the most brilliant part of it because this endeavor solves a whole different problem. If you've learned something from this video, I hope it's that Mardi Gras is not just a holiday, it's also an industry. There are people who make their livelihood for part or sometimes all of the year on selling the throws, producing the floats, and just like everybody in the tourist and service economy, which we can't responsibly have right now, those folks are out of a job right now. So after the crew of House Floats idea came to be, a group called the Crew of Red Beans, one of our walking crews, which every year decorates their own costumes and sometimes entire vehicles with bean mosaics, decided to add in this additional program, which they called Hire a Mardi Gras Artist. And through this, people in an area can pool resources, hire a team of Mardi Gras professionals, and get a house in their neighborhood done in a way that really shows off the professionalism. And they've all got different commentaries on New Orleans and Louisiana culture. We have one that's called The Night Tripper that's dedicated to the imagery of local musician Dr. John. We've got one called Acadiana Hayride, which shows several Cajun musicians doing their version of a wandering musical parade. We've got one called Birds of Bulbancha, which shows some of the local wildlife and is named after the name for this region in the Choctaw language, the language of the dominant Native American tribe here. One of them is a fully realized Mardi Gras float 
but built around some existing trees, which you can't do with a rolling float on the theme of Midsummer Night's Dream. And one of them is called the Queen's Jubilee and celebrates healthcare professionals. So more of these are gonna be coming and whether you're here or not, you can check them out yourself. From a distance, you can look up terms like Yardy Gras, one of the hashtags that people are using to file these, as well as crew of house floats. And whether you're here or not, the website for our local newspaper, NOLA.com, has both a map and photos of them. Besides making these video tours, Free Tours by Foot is also an in-person tour company, and we operate out of New Orleans and lots of other cities. Our tours are all pay what you will. It's a trust-based system, and if you like the sound of that and you like what you see today, you can find links in the description to tip your guide. Thank you for watching, and please let us know down in the comments what you thought and what else you'd like to see from us in the future. Like as well as subscribing, and you'll make sure to be first to know when those next videos come out, and I hope you have the best Tuesday of your year coming up.